Hi, in this video, I'm going to calculate the Black Scholes option pricing model. And I'm going to use that to calculate the price of a call option, the price of a put option, and to identify whether put call parity holds. And I'm going to use this question, typical of a, a standard financial derivatives question in which we have to calculate the price of these options, puts and calls. So let's take a look at the variables that we need for them. So we need to know Firstly, that the stock price, which in this case is 113.50, the strike being near the money here, 115, the risk free interest rate at 0.8%, the volatility at 12%, and the time to maturity is five months. So I'm going to summarize all of those in Excel and I'll show you the formula. There are five formulas that we're going to work with. Um, don't be put off by them. But they're straightforward enough once we know what each of the variables represent. For example, stock price will be represented by S. The strike price will be represented by X. Okay, and here we have the formula. The price of a call option is given by this formula here. So we need this N capital N here represents the normal distribution. That it's assumed that the stocks and the option prices follow what's known as a log normal distribution. And this is just a matter of referring to a table that we'll get to soon. But in order to get the value of D1 and D2, we have to work through these two formula here. So I'm just going to summarize the figures. So the stock is 113.50, the strike 115. The time to maturity is given a letter capital T. And that's five months, which is going to be five over 12. The standard deviation. We're just going to get the mat symbol. was 12%, so that has to be represented as a decimal. And the risk-free interest rate was 0.8%. Divide that by 100, 0 0.008. So these are the key variables that we need to work with. And we'll plug these into the values. We'll plug these values into the formula for D1, because you, you can't get the call option just yet. Okay, we need to get the natural log of stock over strike. Okay, if you're not working on Excel, I have a, a calculator that we can work with and I'll show it to you in a moment. So, equals LN and simply stock divided by your strike. To show that using a calculator, if you're using a scientific calculator, just look for your natural log. Don't forget to put in your bracket. And we have our answer again, minus 0 0.01313. Next, we'll take the top right of this equation. So I have it written out here. So we have the rate risk free interest rate plus the standard deviation squared, which is your volatility squared or your variance, divide that by two and multiply that by the time to maturity. So D5, which I have here labeled 0 0.008. plus your standard deviation squared. So we go to your standard deviation and we'll square that. Divide that 
divide that by your two, close your bracket. And we'll multiply that by your time to maturity, which is in cell D3. Again, you can work that out on the scientific calculator, but make sure you do each step and I advise you to press equals each time. So do your standard deviation squared divided by two first, add on your OR, find your answer for that, and then multiply it by your time to maturity. Next is your denominator of D1. So that's your standard deviation multiplied by square root of time to maturity. Okay, and we should have enough now to go by in order to find our value for D1. We just follow the formula, top left plus the top right, and we divide that by the denominator we just found. Okay. And we can also find D2, which is your D1 minus standard deviation multiplied multiply by the square root of the time to maturity, which we already have done here. Okay. So now that we have D1 and D2, notice that we have to get these as a normal distribution value, and we need tables for that. So along with a question, you should be able to identify what's known as your, your normal distribution tables. And there's going to be two of them, one where you have x is greater than or equal to zero, in other words, a positive value for D1 or D2, and another table whereby they're going to be negative, okay, or less than zero, which in our case, D1 and D2 were both negative. So we have to use those tables. Okay, notice that to find the values, these values here, you need values that are to two decimal places. So for example, a 0.22 would give you this value here. But in our case, the decimals we had were about three or four values. So we're gonna use a formula that we have here and we're gonna use that as our guide. And for more information on this, I will probably do a, another video that you can resort to. Okay, so I'm just gonna follow this here to, in order to identify how or what figure we should get that would best represent the values for D1 and D2 that we just found. Okay. So to get 0 0.08, we look up that value 0, and there we have the 8. So 0 0.4681 is a value that we need. So that would be the equivalent of this value here in the formula. So 0 0.4681. Next, we subtract the remainder of that decimal we got for D1, which is 774. So that's seen as a decimal 0.774. So that's the equivalent of three, almost three quarters of the next value that we're going to get, which is a value between the 0 0.08 and the 0 0.09. So again, we use the 0 0.08 negative and the next number after it, the negative 0 0.09. So I'm going to use these two values here and also the remainder of this value here, the 774. So 
0.4681 was the value for minus 0 0.08. The remainder of that was your 774, so we call it 0.774. We want to multiply that bigger by, again, your value for the point or negative 0 0.08, which we already have found in the tables, and we already use a 0.4681. And we subtract that by the value we got for 0 0.09, which we saw was 0 0.4641. So we have a normal value of 0 0.465. We're going to do the very same for ND2. And what we had found for ND2 was minus 0.1652. So I'll get to tables again to see what we actually need here. So again, to just at two decimal places, so we're going to look for minus 0.16. So there's minus 0.1 and the 6. So this is the value we're going to use. Because there's more than two decimal figures to two decimal places, we're going to use the 0 0.52, which is almost halfway between the 0 0.16 and the 0 0.17. And there's the 0 0.17. So there are the two values we're going to use, and we're going to repeat what we just had done for ND1. So we had for minus 0.16, we had a value of 0.4364. And we minus the remainder of that, which is your 0.52. Multiply that by your value for, again, minus 0.16 which we found on the tables to be 0.4364. And we subtract the value for the minus 0.17, which we found to be 0.4325. And that's your value for ND2. So we now have all the values that we need in order to calculate the price of a call option. So let's look at again the formula. So the stock multiplied by ND1. So the stock multiplied by ND1. And we're going to subtract this part of the equation. which is your strike price, multiply by your constant value or the exponential function, which is 2.71828. And that's to the power of minus RT. And finally, what we need is ND2, and we have that already. I'm just going to put it all together. The one under the other, and we should be able to find the price of our call option after that. So I'm just going to work through this. This value minus this by ND2. And the price of a call option is two ninety nine. So now that we've found the price of a call option, the price of a put option is quite straightforward. So here we have the formula for the put option. A lot of this is already done. 
all we need is n minus d2 and n minus d1. But we don't have to go to the same extent in terms of looking up tables. All it is for n minus d2 is 1 minus n d2. So for n minus d1, it's 1 minus n d1. And likewise for n minus d2, it's 1 minus nd2. So now we're ready to get the calculation or the value for the put option. So notice we need to strike times e to the power minus rt again. We already had that in the, the price for the call option. I'm just going to copy this over. We also need n minus d2. And then we need, if you notice here, the stock price times n minus d1. So that's the stock multiply n minus d1. Okay, and finally the price of a put to strike this value here. Multiply by n minus d2 minus your stock price times n minus d1. So four dollars and eleven cent. So that's the price of a call and price of a put, and now we have to identify whether put call parity holds. On the bottom left, we have the call plus the strike times e to the power of minus rt equals the price of a put plus the stock price, and we have all of these already. So put call parity is your price of a call plus strike times e to the power minus rt. We have that again already. And we should hopefully get a side value that's equal on this side as well. And we have the price of a put plus the stock price. And we'll get this over here. And again, we have put call parity 117.61 rounded. So that's how we calculate the price of a call option, price of a put option for a non-dividend paying stock. We don't have dividends as part of these, this variable here and the put call parity. I hope you enjoyed this video and got to learn a bit more about Black Skulls option pricing model. Thanks for watching.